Hear Me See Me podcast is sponsored by Zenoti, the number one cloud software for salons and spas. Because when people feel good, they find their greatness. I am Stuart Roberts, and I'm really excited to introduce my new podcast, Hear Me See Me. It's just over five years ago. I did something that changed my life. What it did, more than I could have ever realised, it helped me. I have met some absolutely amazing people, some of the people that work in some of these places. Many of them are volunteers, but some of them, it is their job. I had this idea after being inspired by a guy in America I'd seen cutting hair on the streets and seeing the difference it made to the guys who were there. This is more than a job. This is a calling. Hello, this is Stuart from Hear Me See Me podcast. And today I've got a wonderful woman I've never met before. And it's, it's really interesting when you have a chat and you've never met. We got introduced by the lovely Stu Whiffin. And um, he told me a bit, so I wanted to know a lot more. Today I'm talking to Amelia Rope. How are you, my dear? I'm good. Hello, Stuart. Lovely to meet you. And also all your lovely listeners too. Oh, it's on a very cold day. So if I put my hat on, it's because I don't allow myself heating in the day. And if no. I get cold, as I've told you already, my hair is thinning. You've told me it's due to the pandemic. So there might be a hat going on. But anyway, enough waffle, sorry. <laughs> right. Well, before we do anything, I'm as intrigued as anyone listening because I, I purposely not found out too much. So, you know, take me back to the young Amelia the wide-eyed young girl, uh, and tell me about her hopes and aspirations, how it actually turned out for you. Uh, so as a child, I was pretty independent, and I hated being told what to do. Absolutely hated it. I had to find out for myself. So, you know, if someone said don't, I mean, I don't know, I, my father thinks that don't start the car. And my brother and I went into my grandmother's car and started up the car and he shot out. So it's just something I had to explore for myself. And um, I was, I always had a slight cheekiness. And when I was younger, I didn't know how to curb the cheekiness. So some people didn't get it. And I would be really sort of whipped into line with it. Oh, okay. I've obviously slightly over egg pudding. I used to be really sarcastic. And my parents kept saying, sarcasm is the lowest form of wit. And I, and eventually sort of grew out of it. Um, I always, as children, yes, we were lucky in some ways, but uh, we always thought the value of money. So we didn't get pocket money. We earned our money. And um, I used to just do odd jobs. And I, I liked the way, one of them was dusting the thunderflies. We don't have thunderflies anymore, do we? Do you remember them? You know, those tiny little black, they almost look like a splinter. Yeah. We, we we, them, I think we had them last year, I saw some. Okay, well, we used to have low, I mean, I don't know where they've gone, climate change, whatever, but actually that's one asset of climate, climate change they have gone. But um, so I, one of my jobs was dusting thunderflies off pots of bicarbonate of soda in the local garage. I was about eight or nine. I just remember that vividly. But anyway, I used to make Christmas cakes and I looked after people's kids and stuff like that. So, and I really enjoyed it. I liked the feeling of cash in my hand and it taught me the value of money. And... Uh, we had a very disciplined upbringing, which now I'm very grateful. So uh, you were seen and not heard, really. Um, and But my parents were, were good people. They were, they were just very independent spirits themselves. So me and my brother are quite independent. We all stand on our own two feet. Um, and school, I went to the same school in Colchester uh, from the age of about three and a half to the age of 16. And my teachers were absolutely fed up with me and I was really fed up with them and I used to always I was always the person Stuart who would get get into trouble so I'd always support someone's cause okay and say that's not fair and I would be the one who would be sort of reprimanded and outside the headmistress's door one time was for throwing bread on the floor but anyway the point of it is is that I was slightly rebellious and um I, I was tricky for my poor mother I gave her a bit of a hard time I was also unhappy and I was frustrated and uh, I put on quite a lot of weight and my mother still is very striking and she was just beautiful and her figure was just 
amazing. And, you know, I, I wanted, she was my role model. And yet here was me, this around little thing. And my brother calling me fatty. And at the time he was very lean. Uh, and, and so that was one of my sort of struggles. Um, and yeah, I, I didn't really get into school. I didn't really get into being taught learning a load uh I wanted to be a fashion designer uh at one stage then I wanted to be a lawyer then I wanted to be this that and the other anyway before I waffle on I then with my sort of upbringing it was very it was very traditional and conventional and the thing was that uh I was expected really to be a secretary and to meet a stockbroker in my early 20s or all that sort of equivalent and be a wife okay have kids and that's it and uh basically that wasn't who I was and I could blame my first boyfriend for dumping me uh but uh, but you can't blame anyone basically it was just not in my essence I lost you for a second. Then. Yes, we're back. Okay. So back. I don't know if you Fine. I don't know if you want me to continue the the uh, thing, but so basically that took me to my twenties. I then trained as a PA. Yeah. I got bored of the jobs, and so I used to move every single year, and that drove my parents nuts. It drove the job agencies nuts because your CV was only supposed to be one or two pages, and mine went on to four pages. And uh, it was diff- it was a difficult time. I mean, you I think you were around in that stage. It was, you know, on your CV you had to put whether you were single, whether you were married, whether you had children. There's a lot of labelling going on of, you know, well she's in her mid twenties, so she's probably going to get married and have children. She probably leave us and whatever else. Um, now you're not allowed to do that. I think it's very healthy. But anyway, so I did that, and uh, that was my sort of twenties. And um, do you want me to take you through my thirties? There's yeah. so much ramble. That's the That's problem. Fine. It's a ramble chat. Nice. Uh, so, it, and it, you know, my tw- I was based in London and, uh, yeah, so I did loads. And then in my 30s, I because so much has happened in my life, I, I, it probably loses its chronology, but um, I trained as a massage therapist. I was working at Warburg's, okay, as a, as a PA, and it was really stressful. I mean, my God, I did some stuff where I just thought, ah, it's, you know, it was, de- it was in the corporate finance department, and it was, it, was, it was scary and stressful. And it was at the time where Essex girls, because I'm an Essex girl, yeah. were sort of dis- dismissed as dancing around handbags, white stilettos yes. and stuff like that. Anyway, so... Uh, while I was there, I started doing a part-time massage course, okay? And um, I went off and, and trained in it, and uh, I really enjoyed it. My parents are quite re- re- remote with that sort of thing, or my mother anyway, and so it taught me the whole thing of touch and intimacy yeah. in a totally professional manner, okay? Yeah. So I set up my massage business great you know I did beautiful leaflets I went to people's houses I got a few lechy men but anyway onwards yes. and then I uh had a bike accident and uh I somersaulted over the handlebars of my bike and this is a lesson for all your lovely listeners is do not put your shopping on the handlebars because I did and I turned the wheel I was going quite fast and just sort of landed in the road so nobody stopped to help me at all it was in the king's road and uh i was in such shock and i locked up the bike carried back these bags of shopping and luckily i had a flatmate at the time and i arrived saying i've had a bike accident but i'm fine because this was always me i'm okay i don't need any help but actually i chipped the head off my left elbow and broke my right wrist big learning curve but it was clearly telling me you are not supposed to be massaging because that was off and I didn't have any income support and it was it was pretty tough my parents I don't think realized the enormity of it so then I went to live in the states which I really loved and I wanted to live there I just fell in love with it because everybody in the US they like us lot you know over here I was I don't know I just felt like a a thorn in I don't know (laughs) um so I went over there fell in love with it came back and then I got all into the health uh, world and I um, 
worked in the admin side but for some fascinating people in private hospitals uh, NHS hospitals and I realized that actually if I'd been allowed to go to university which I wasn't and that's that was a big bitter regret against my parents for a long long time I'm now at peace with it but I gave them real hell for it um, I would have liked to have been something like an endocrinologist because hormones especially being a woman are yeah. fascinating yeah. and one little hormone out can jigger the whole thing yeah. Uh, so then I, uh, got into, uh, the weight was a big issue still and it, it and, uh, and the uni thing. And, and I decided to go to university and I got into the university of Westminster and I studied nutrition and then herbal medicine. And then I stopped cause I ran out of money. I mortgaged a flat that I had and it was Anyway, it's a long story. It backfired and I had to sue the bloody developer. Excuse my language. I had to sue the developer next door. Anyway, whatever. So I then went and did an aromatherapy course. We're nearly there. I did an aromatherapy course uh, for six months, which was incredible. And I loved it. And I did a cancer care course with it for six months afterwards. And, and the work experience is in a hospice, which was the most humbling experience. Um, and then I set up my aromatherapy company. And uh, that was all fine. But then 9-11 happened and it just, there was, it was an odd time. And I ran out of cash and went back to live with my parents. And that was a challenge for both, for all parties. And uh, then I went and temped, yeah, in the NHS in Colchester. And then eventually I moved back to London, proper job again, father relieved, practice manager of a doctor's practice. That was him at peace his daughter was earning a good salary she was fine she'd met a guy this could really tick the box no she splits from the guy not actually my fault he was one of my guests on my show some friend there and uh and the job after three and a half years I was sort of burnt out and I went to see a life coach at the time this is about 2005 and she got me to believe in myself because I didn't believe in myself and I applied to go on MasterChef because the chap who dumped me lived nearby and I just it, I had Bridget Jones moment and got very low. And so I watched Thomasina Myers win MasterChef and I thought, that's it, I'm going to give this a pop. So I applied and I got on it and then they asked me to go back on the show. And John Tarode, after the first show, came back and said, what you have in your head is unique. You've got to do something with it, go and train. I didn't because of the cash and the job and everything else. But it was a little itch. And it's all these things, Stuart, that once you start getting people believing in you, you start thinking, you know what? I've got to do, I've got to work with it. So that, that took me up to, to um, before I set up my chocolate business. Wow. I'm worn out. Oh, well, there you go. That's why I've stopped. Because <laughs> otherwise, it's just why I'm great. Rab it on. <laughs> but you can oh. see my life has quite a few things. I also lived in Kenya. I forgot that. I went to live in Kenya. Oh. And when I was out there, I broke my foot. And they didn't mend it correctly. So I had to come back and have a screw put in it and a bone graft. I think that's when I got into the health thing. Yeah. My life has been full. Of course. And it, it, I'm going to go back now because there was yep. a time when... Um, things were really quite difficult for you. And yeah. you, said, you said that, you know, finances were worse than your parents realised. What about it? What is it about you that didn't then share that with your parents? Why did you go that alone at that point? Uh, I usually do share with my parents. My parents, oh, it's my father. My mother is, is different, but my father is someone who was brought up that you – you're responsible for yourself. And also, they don't have loads of cash. I can't just go back and say, hey, you know, slip us a grand. That my dad wasn't earning much money. He worked in PR. But also, he, he, he was frustrated with me because ultimately, I was setting up my own gig. You know, why wasn't I getting a proper job? Why was I throwing away security for the sake of doing all this stuff. Now, his family were entrepreneurs. They were ransom lawmowers on my grandmother's side. They were brewers on my grandfather's side. They created the plough. They created the Suffolk Punch horse, you know, all this stuff. But because it's not in his nature and he's not a risk taker, nor is my brother, they were horrified. And my, they have bailed me out. My dad has bailed me out in the past. Yeah. But, but, you know, through my life, it was a repetitive cycle of 
seriously flying by the seat of my pants, more so when I had my chocolate business. But um, it wasn't my fault I broke both my arms. I don't think they really realised. I went on benefit for a bit. Um, and I went to stay with my godmother, who's very, she's a very special lady. Um, and she sort of cocooned around me. That's, uh, tell me about her. Uh, she was called Dione, and she was an amazing woman who, actually, I haven't talked about her for years, so it's a real treat, and it makes me feel quite emotive. She was like my adopted mother, and I was very lucky that she was picked as my godmother. She understood me because I couldn't even understand myself. I was quite complex in my head, and... Um, she offered me a home. She always offered me an ear. She offered me wise counsel when I had my wisdom teeth removed and it backfired because, uh, anyway, they sort of bled horrendously. I went back to recoup at Dione's, okay, which really hacked my mother off because Dione would control the visiting hours. <laughs> and and so, um, but no, she was a very special woman and I, I'm actually godmother to her granddaughter and her daughter, Catherine, is a very dear friend of mine. So she was very special. She taught me a lot. She was very, she came from a really traditional background, conventional background, and yet she was interested in mediums. She was interested in um, going to have your cards read, all this stuff. And she sort of, she expanded my thinking process. Um, yeah, she was, she was an incredible woman. And it, that goes back to a time, you know, quite a while ago when the role of godmother, godfather wasn't just a ceremonial thing. It, mm -hmm. There was actually a role involved, wasn't there? It yeah. doesn't seem to be so much like that now, does it? But I suppose you're going to take it more seriously because you had someone show you how to be a godmother. Yeah, good point. I mean, I have, I don't have children myself. Um, I, it sort of, my life is sort of, I don't know, a bit late in the day. But um, I have four godchildren. And I adore them, and um, I, I suppose I try and spoil them because they're not my kids. I drive the parents nuts because I'll be giving them too much sugar or this, that, and the other. But um, they're, very, they're, they're really special people. So, yeah, I do take it seriously because I think if you don't have grandparents, I don't know if you've found this, but it's really nice to have an older ear who has time for you and who isn't in the intensity of the family bubble. Yeah. Do you have good parents? Uh, or people like that? Did you have? I don't know. I have got good parents. Yeah, yeah. I believe. I believe that. Um, I believe it's my aunt and uncle. My uncle passed away some time ago, but I'm sure it's my aunt and uncle. But um, but it was. It was often. Uh, my mum was uh, one of six, so there was lots of aunties. Wow. Aunt, and you, you know. But I've got five kids and, and three grandchildren. Have you? And, yeah. Yeah, I didn't so, five. Wow. Yeah, and it's it's that sort of um, the extended family. You know, you you could. You, I used to sort of see quite a bit of aunties and uncles and things, but it's it, as it as society's changed a bit now, isn't it? So you become more. It's more like just just your own close knit family, and you don't. You know, we don't sort of have that so much, and I don't think people definitely don't take that role as seriously. But good parents. You know, it, it, no. it tends to be about the day itself. And to be honest, we've had a controversy with, like, my mum was quite disappointed. We never had our children christened, and so ours, ours, ours haven't got good parents at all. You it's know. good for extra gifts. That, that's what we well, liked. Extra yeah, gifts yeah, at Christmas yeah. and birthdays. Yeah. Like, yes! Yeah. <laughs> but, it's, but, but, yeah, I think, I mean, it was an older generation. I think less so now. I mean, one of my godchildren, Henry, who's just adorable uh he i want to match make him with one of the god daughters i reckon they've really hit it off too young at the moment but anyway he he hasn't been christened but i'm his right unofficial. his sort of unofficial godmother yeah yeah i mean it was the thing at the time i was quite i don't, I don't feel strongly about it at all now but i did at the time i just felt it was all about the ceremonial side of it mm. in anything um uh, yeah, I don't regret not doing it, but um, they've asked me a couple of times, some of the kids, saying, like, well, why aren't we, why didn't that happen? I said, well... But they can still do it. They uh, can yeah, go and get christened, can't they? I'll let you find out for yourself. See what you weren't yeah. believing later on in life, you know, you know, find your own way, you know. Yeah, I'm not particularly religious, but I, um, yeah, I don't know. If, I, if I'd had children, I probably would have done just because I would have done. Yeah, 
gifts, gifts. Yeah. I think that's why me and my brother are quite attractive as godparents because we don't have yeah. our own kids. So there's that whole thing. I want, I wonder if you know we'll get this. Yeah. I wonder if she will make money that she could pay for X's education. <laughs> <laughs> Not yet. So oh, what yeah. was the? I didn't, I didn't realize you'd been on MasterChef. So what, what was that experience? That must have been quite. Uh, the master chef was incredible because it opened doors it was terrifying i mean the pressure and you know it's nothing like what it is today now the pressure they're under is huge i was way out of my depth and um but i i managed somehow to sort of wing it and uh john and greg were great um i really enjoyed it i won the restaurant rounds i felt very structured in that i loved the team the buzz that's stressful though because all of a sudden it's like four this ten that and it's like jeez and you're frying and i made a risotto on one of them i can't remember what this other one oh i had to learn how to deep it so so it was pretty good but i went on it in 2006 and then they asked me to go back on the next year because it was at the time when they asked people to come back in and so you came back in on a quarter final level Anyway, it didn't go well because the oven packed up, the grill d- collapsed, and so my jus or whatever I was doing burnt dry, and so there wasn't a sauce. Um, and so I won the restaurant round game, but you know, I was way out of my depth. I mean, I always yeah. have been out of my depth in life, but that was just crazy. But not because it helped me open up who I really was supposed to be. Yeah. So, um, you know, it was, it was, it was incredible. The second time around, I went part-time my job as practice manager and uh, used a bit of cash I'd made on selling my flat in Peckham and sort of went on various courses because I thought I will not cry. The first time I cried, okay, I sobbed and it was horrendous and they loved that, which (laughs) was I think I was asked back on. I thought I'm not going to cry. Yeah. But, um, no, it was an incredible honour. And, you know, the thing is, Stuart, is, and you probably have this with your life, and, and probably the listeners do, is who would know we'd be doing what we're doing, where we're doing, no. who we're doing it with? It's no. fascinating. Yeah, yeah, those moments when you just think, hang on a minute, did that just happen? Well, it must be, like, with some of your guests. You know, you must be yeah. sitting there thinking, wow, I'm talking to X, Y, or Z. Yeah, it has, I have had that moments, the pinch-me moments. Yeah, pinch-me uh, moments. I love that. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. So where, when, when did it go from – so you, after the second time you went on MasterChef, where did, yeah. it, where did it lead you to next? So after the same time on MasterChef, I, um, I'd been to see this life coach, Kay, self-belief. I knew I had to leave my job and I didn't know what my parents were going to say because it, it was a big risk, you know. And um, so I started, what well, I can't remember the order of it. I always wanted to be, or I not always wanted, I wanted to be a food journalist after MasterChef, not the preparation because remember I had an issue with weight and stuff. So I didn't want to be knocking up shoe buns and me foil and whatever else it was going to be. So um, I don't know why I picked those two examples, random. Uh, so anyway, I then um, uh, wrote to, I wanted to, to, to be a food journalist and the, the magazine I really admired was William Sitwell's Food Illustrated. It was before Waitrose bought it. And so I wrote to him and I remember I went to this station, a really smart station and I bought pale pink cards and a brown pen, okay, because I needed to grab him, so his attention. And I wrote saying, I love what you do. I want to get into food journalism. I've been on MasterChef twice, booted off. And he rang up saying, come and see me. And this is another example to anyone thinking, should I, shouldn't I? Just do it. They might not get in touch, but the point is they might. So he, I went to see him and I'd made some of these amazing little truffles. And he tasted them and he really loved them. And he said, you're the next Juliette Binoche, okay? You know, Chocolat and Johnny Depp when he was really sexy. I mean, my God, he was sexy. But anyway, uh, so I thought, wowee, this is it. I'm going to meet someone like Johnny um, Johnny Depp have a lovely chocolate shop and blah 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 uh, I don't think William really realised what he was doing but it was him okay again believing in me and so um, I he then introduced me to a couple of people I wrote a column and then I had this vision of rose petals that um because I love gardens and flowers and trees and stuff, which had chocolate at the bottom and a bit of gold leaf on them. And it took me three months of trying to work out how to crystallise rose petals, how to find 
edible rose petals because you can't just buy them off the street store. They could have so many chemicals on. Anyway, I did this and I showed them to a friend of mine who used to work for Harper's Bazaar and she said, you've got to get this out to the press. You might get one mention in six months, okay? Yeah. Took the day off work, loaded up the car. I was renting a flat. I had, I mean, I was so lucky mice didn't get in. The whole of the living room floor was covered in, you know, those racks, the oven racks, okay, with rose petals on, with chocolate and God knows what, sugar and everything. Anyway, I... It just took off. I mean, it was quite surreal. And it, I had Stella magazine from the Telegraph and then the Daily Mail and then Brides magazine and then Paul O'Grady show that went on that and then Vanessa Phelps because they were unique. They were, as I said myself, they were the most divine works of art. And my, my proudest moment, one of them, was supplying uh, Sting who was my heart throb, okay? Yeah. He, I was a member of the Atlantis fan club and stuff, and I had such a crush on him. And I, it was a small order for vi- violets, you know, the little purple flowers, and I dipped them in chocolate, and I delivered it, and Trudy Styler opened the door, and my jaw was like... <laughs> but I also thought, oh, where is Sting? Yeah. But anyway, so um, I did all that, and, of course, it had huge sex appeal. Dragon's Den approached me, and my parents were sweet, and my brother, he sold a car, put money into the business. I got this really expensive fridge for eight grand, never worked, took on this really expensive place and converted it into a kitchen, barely used it, and I really learned the hard way that um, I, I didn't do it in the correct way. And then from that, I really lived in a very precarious way and um, I had no money. I had bailiffs at the door in the way that um, Lloyd's Bank, and I will mention them because it's truly shocking. I hope they're not a sponsor. Uh, have they, uh, and they've improved since then, but uh, basically they promised me a loan for the business and they said, because I'd got a business plan, okay, and they said, put it on your Barclay card and we'll clear what, just while we're sorting out the loan and then you can move the loan money in to clear the Barclay card. So then we had 2007 and the crunch and yeah. they wouldn't give me the loan. And I had a lot of money. To me, it was a lot at the time, eight or nine grand on that card. And I couldn't pay anything back. And I was in the shit. And excuse my language again. And so basically, I um, it was a bleak time. And I, my parents, my, my, my mother doesn't have any money anyway, but my dad was very, you know, you put yourself in this, we've put the money in it, you've got to sort it out. Fair enough, fair enough. But it was a really stressful black time and I was very low and very depressed and wondered what life was all about. And then with life, you might have found this sort of guardian angels come along just when you need them. And Stu, lovely Stu, is my latest guardian angel. Yeah. So basically, they, they, um, they, this, uh, it's through the power of chat too, but I went to help out in a local curtain company and this guy kept popping in and chatting to the guy who owned it. And it turned out that he was a guy called Pat Reeves and he was um, founder of Deliverance. I don't know if you guys will know Deliverance, but it was the first London delivery company to be able to deliver a pizza and a burger and a whatever else. And they, they sold out. They did very well. And then they set up Sofa.com. I don't know if you've heard of Sofa.com. Anyway, he was an amazing guy. And one day he said to me, I want you to come and work for me. Okay. It really pissed poor Dave off from the curtain company because he was like, but hold on, Pat, I found Amelia. What's going on? Anyway, I immediately said, I'm with you. And so I went down and it was to look after him for a day. It's basically to, I don't know, to do his house. He was a really, I talked about him in the past because sadly he died, but he was, he was a real bachelor. Okay. And he lived life to the full. And he had this really cool hound called Louie, who he'd adopted from Bassey Dog's home, who was a staffy. Brilliant. Anyway, I was there to just, I don't know, I cooked. I filled his freezer with food. uh, And then I did his admin. And we just became very good friends. And he was my wise counsel. And he was the one who had the idea of the chocolate bars. So in my youth, I used to say no to everything. You could say, Amelia, do you want to come on the show? No, I'm okay, thanks. Do you want to do it? No, I'm fine. Someone else would say, do you want to come on a date? No, I'm fine. And it was this protective mechanism, which was frustrating. But anyway, Pat helped me, and he was the one who said chocolate bar. And that turned my business around from doing the truffles and the petals into having a bar that had shelf life, durability, you know, and sex appeal. And But when he said chocolate bar, I said, no way. So boring. Not my bag. And then, you know, he wore away at the stone. And then he said, okay, 
I've put some money in this business. We've got a little envelope out, scratched away. And he said, I reckon we'll need 60 grand. I'll help you. No, I'm fine. I don't need your help. Oh, my God. So, and then Pat bought this Maserati straight afterwards for 45 grand. Actually, the thing never worked, so I had the final laugh. But I just thought, oh, God, what am I doing? Anyway, the point is that Pat helped me. Uh, he lent me money to clear the loan from on my, my card and so I could breathe again. And I never told him because I was I'm quite proud in that way. But he kept he kept saying to me, something isn't right. What what is going on? And so I opened it up to him and, and he said, Fine, I'll set you up a loan. We clear that, you pay me back every month, which I did, and then we're done. And um, anyway, so the bar, and so then he said, um, I'll put in a commission for a thousand bars. And it was in November 2009, I think, I can't remember. And um, he gave me six weeks' notice at the busiest time, busiest time of year. And that is a nightmare to find anyone to do anything because every chocolate maker is going hell for leather. Yeah. And, he, and so I had to get the packaging sorted, the supply, the recipe, and someone to make it. So I found someone to make it, and Pat said craft paper. I went for the coloured foil, and I hand-foiled every flipping bar I hand signed every bar I put the number of the addition of the bar and I did this all in his sitting room okay with his dog by my side so health and safety would have been (laughs) anyway Pat paid me not in profit with another thousand bars so his thousand bars went out with a sofa to try and spread the word I then had a thousand bars that I flogged people I brought in the milk bar and milk chocolate bar and I dropped them off William Sitwell said you need to get these to you inventors who then was the director of Selfridges now he's the CEO of Fortnum's and he's about to move from Fortnum's to House and Worth and he said I want them and so that just opened the door so I launched in Selfridges and they were the first people who stopped them and then I was naive and I just thought as you all know it doesn't happen like this it just goes all the way up from here yeah. and that sure as heck <laughs> is not the roller coaster ride that we sign up to no. so where did it go from there uh, from there, I, I was on a roll. I won awards. I mean, I was like, flip. I did these recipe combinations with sea salt. People loved them. And, and um, I used my head as an aromatherapist. So I blended as if I was blending a, a, yeah. a blend. So some would be really strong. Some would be really subtle. Um, and I was just the golden girl. You know, I was the, uh, the first woman. Well, I was one of the first to name their chocolate brands in the UK after their name. I don't think anyone else did. That immediately puts you on a level because I'm a high achiever that you don't want anything to be slapdash because your name is on it. Uh, and I was on my own in the business and people like that story and they like the MasterChef connection. So really it was pretty easy. But, but I had no cash. So each the bit of stock I made had to go back into the business. And um, I, as a result, I moved 15 times in 15 months, which was tough. And I would house sit for people. So Pat would say, I'm off skiing for the month. Do you want to house sit and look after Louis or whatever? So I'd move in there. My brother was an utter saint and still remains a saint and would say, okay, you can come back, but not this long, you know, all this stuff. And then a friend would say, oh, this guy's got a spare room or she's got a spare room or whatever. I lost a lot of stuff, but it taught me to be very nimble. So I don't have many knickknacks in my life because I'm used to moving, packing. I still rent. Uh, So... Um, and then it just more people came in the market space. Uh, I wasn't a businesswoman. I was learning on the hoof. Uh, I had problems because I wasn't actually making these bars. So I had to move production because people would say, we don't want a hand foil. Your batches are too small. We haven't got anywhere to store. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, it, it just sort of, it, it sort of, I started doing export and, uh, I had all the approaches to it. I just didn't have the back plug to put into the approaches. And I was annoyed because people like James Martin's show approached me, but I didn't have the production unit, so I lost that gig. That would have been massive. Yeah. Um, And uh, so, anyway, I created all these bars, and uh, I don't know, my brain is slightly sort of woolly on it now, but it was just – it was – it, it was good, and then I lost accounts, not through my fault, because I learned that buyers, if they moved, they'd bring someone new in. Yeah. Um, 
And it's just, it was very hard work. One person spread very thinly. And every investor I spoke to just either didn't get me or didn't get the business or, importantly, did not want a woman in charge. And it really annoyed me. And I lobbied my local MP. And I ended up meeting Vince Cable, who was, I don't think he was the business secretary then or something. I just said, you have got to support people in small businesses. Because the thing is that Selfridges was my first supplier, but actually I had no money to reach the order. And the bank because my credit history was useless. And actually, Pat went along with me to a bank, who actually is my bank now, and they're very good. And he said, listen, let's do the enterprise loan. Back, I'll back it. I don't think this guy had any idea how much cash Pat had in his account. I'll back it. I'll guarantee it. I'll be a director, whatever else. Yeah. He didn't get the loan. And so and my father said, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll guarantee the overdraft just to get the first gig off and running. And they wouldn't. And Pat was someone who would never spoon feed, okay? He's not just somebody say, you know, here you go. You've got to find your own way. So uh, in the end, I can't remember how I did it, but I, oh, I know, I raised seven grand from family and friends. Yeah. And that helped me get into Selfridges. So, the, the, you know, it was, it, was, it was really tough at times being a woman in business and people taking you seriously. And uh, the co- some competitors were dirty and there was one person who will remain nameless who blatantly copied my packaging. And really? he, it, he, he took a market space that I was starting to own and he copied it to the measurement of the craft paper and the foil. And he had the cheek to say that he had the idea from going to his post office and seeing the craft paper. And I had to get legal lawyers involved and he said he'd change it. He didn't. He's since gone into liquidation. But it, but it was really not, I don't like that sort of play. If you're going to be an entrepreneur, be original. You know, do not take people's ideas. And a lot of, I found a lot of my delis disappointingly went with this person. And I'm like, wow, you know, he shafted my business. Or, I mean, that sounds bitter and twisted. It was also at the time where Pat died. Another really good mate of mine dropped out dead the day before Pat's memorial service. And then someone else died. So it was, it was an interesting time. So where did, where did, what happened then to the, to the brand? So the brand is – the brand uh, – was still rolling along and I was looking um, to extract myself from it. I knew that it was, there wasn't enough money in it. So every approach I had to say no. Japan loved my product. I sold in Japan, which is the hugest honor, but I had no money to go over there to back it up, support it. The US loved it. You know, I mean, it, it had sex appeal, Middle East. I supplied the Royals, but it, I just didn't yeah. have the infrastructure. And then, you know, someone did invest and my gut was don't, don't take this. And stupidly, I did. And stupidly, it was a massive learning. Nobody, no, no parties go into something for it not to work. But it, it, it was something that I got taught a very big lesson. Yeah. And uh, so I became ill. I'm not so. I did. I got um, an autoimmune condition where uh, your ankles swell up and then you, you can't kneel. You can barely move. I had, like, red wheels between my uh, ankle and shins. And the professor... A PCH diagnosed it and it's sarcoidosis so it affects your lungs your it's arthritic and your blood and basically it made me think actually you know what enough yeah I, I, I just I'm not I, I'm not enjoying it and also I love travel and stuff I wasn't doing anything that I liked so the brand is still there it's going dormant but you know I'm doing the chocolate in the so hope and patience anybody who likes it the combination I've got at the moment is lemon and sea salt uh, I, I'm doing the bar for hope and patience, but it's not for sale. It's just uh, for, for giveaways, gifts, really. Thank yeah. yous. So, um, what is? Tell me about hope and patience. So, hope and patience is my podcast, and and it's a podcast really um, set up because I wanted something like this to listen to, and uh, it's really uh, to inspire people who've got their own businesses who are thinking of starting up. Or people are just curious about what it takes to be someone because there are quite a few people who in the corporate world would love to do like, you know, you had your hair dressing business that they, they can't do it because it's just not who they are as personalities. And I do think, I don't know what you think, I think founders are different types of personalities yeah. than, than the sort of corporate players. Uh, both have a role to play in, in the economy. But um so basically, uh, oh gosh, I've forgotten where I was going now. Um, 
you were telling me about the uh, uh, how- oh, the podcast. Crikey, how could I forget that? Okay, so it's four founders that are like, and it basically we look at business, well being, and chocolate. The business side is I speak to founders and we hear how they've got to where they are, and then I like to get under the bonnet a bit, see what makes them tick. Yeah. Some people are really open, others are slightly less open, and then we talk about how they look after themselves. And the point of that is because I became sick. It was purely because I know about yoga. I know about aromatherapy. I know about eating well, but I didn't. Everything went to the wall because of stress. And I became, you know, I was eating my chocolate at 6.30 in the morning. I lived off sugar. I didn't actually put on any weight because I was just constantly on it. Um, So that's what we include. And it's, it's, uh, it became, it sort of, got created at from a very good friend of mine who's my investor in it because we want to really make a difference to people. We want it to be out there and stuff. Um, and uh, he was he knew about my chocolate business and he said, I'll never back you in that business, but I will back you doing right. something. Right. And so I just said, I, I've always wanted to do a documentary and um, I wanted to do it about Columbia where I've been to a couple of times and look at the... Um, cocoa farmers who have worked cocaine in the cocaine industry and stuff yeah. and because i'm not famous i never really got a cut on that anyway so he said okay well, why don't we do youtube and then we got chatting and we got talking about podcasts uh, he likes to chat i obviously love to chat and so hope patience was just created and it's a bit like my chocolate business it just started okay yeah. and, and so this was created it's a massive learning curve because I'm used to being, like here, I'm used to being interviewed. I'm not used to interviewing. And uh, it's just a new industry. And so, you know, it's all the content and research you guys have to do. And then sort of extracting the content and making it interesting. And uh, I just feel very touched to anyone who downloads an episode and, you know, does it. And my guests, are like you, you know, they sort of come my way just when I'm thinking, I wonder who I should get on as a guest. Yeah. Then they suddenly appear. I want to have a mix of guests. So some people, I did have Julian Metcalf of Pratt and Itsu. I want some people who are big, and then I want others, like I was, small businesses. Yeah. Uh, and it's just, it's basically to inspire. We have a bit of a laugh. Uh, so that's really um, the podcast. Yeah, I, I think it's good to have an eclectic mix. You know, some people have got a very, like, streamlined theme going through. Um but yeah, I, I chose to. I, I didn't know. I said, "I'm lying." And why do I lie? Why do I lie so much? I d- I didn't choose. I just it just became very eclectic. <laughs> but I quite like it because it'll go. Because I enjoy it, you know. And you'll find, and you do that. Um, it, it's a nice way to spend an hour, particularly at, at when things are a bit like this and the, the world's gone a bit mad. You can just have an hour of talking to someone and finding out about them. And, if you like and people, meeting it's people, isn't it? It yeah. is. I mean, I would say to anybody who likes people and likes chat and just exploring, because, you know, chatting to you is incredible. I want you as a guest on my show. So, you know, I, I do, because your story is is amazing and I want it to be shared. And what you do is seriously inspirational. It, it, I remember seeing your video, you know, with the National Lottery and I was moved, really moved. And I know a lot of people were and they're talking about it. And that comes from you and that that's just so altruistic and, and incredible and um so yeah I, I, I you you are an inspiration Stuart oh, so I feel you. very honored to be a guest on your show thank you that's very kind and uh, of course I'll reciprocate because I owe you one good <laughs> so I'll pay you in chocolate so hey? what's the future for you like please don't break any more bones <laughs> yeah, don't say Please that. Don't, don't say that. I broke three toes in the first lockdown because I wore, I left my weights, okay, on the floor. And I had a real little routine. If the blinds went down and this, that, and the other, I went out of the routine. Folks, do not get out of your routine. I went in, okay, and I walked straight into my weights. They're only about two kilos. <laughs> I mean, my toes, purple, and they're still not right. No. And so... Um, I now I take a bone complex thing. I don't break. I mean, I break them because I'm not paying attention, not grounded. Uh, my plan is to basically really grow the podcast. I want to create a community. I want to really support small business owners, and then I would like to potentially do a bit of writing with it. 
potentially yeah. uh, do some live shows with it. I just yeah. see where it takes me to. Uh, but that that's sort of what I would like to be doing with it. And it's named after my grannies, Hope. One was hope and one was patience. Oh, brilliant. I think they're two really important virtues that we need to survive or thrive in life. Yeah. And I hope they'd be proud of me. I think they'd be shocked. They didn't like swearing and stuff like that. Oh, yeah. You know, the, the point is that they're, they're part, of, part of the gig and they were two incredible women. Well, I, I, you know, I can, only, I can only wish you well with it. Um, I, I've really, really enjoyed talking to you. I feel like I've got to go and have a lay down now because you've worn me out. <laughs> oh, no, that's not good. Imagine what your listeners are going to be thinking. They're going to be blooming heck. <laughs> well, no, it's good. It's good. It, it was a boring hour. <laughs> you know, oh, it, I feel I've chatted too much. You, I'm sorry. No, you, you, you know, it's fascinating because you, you go through all of these twists and turns and it's, I really relate to it, you know, and it's that, completely open honest story that you've got uh, uh, that you do need to hear the mistakes as well as the, the victories you know and it's that and you've got so much to give people because business is tough and people are tougher and you you know like people will sort of come in and steal something from you and steal your time and you know betray you but also you've got then it's that that endurance you've got to shrug that off and then go again and then go again. You know, you've got to be... Yeah, you get enough highs. You get enough things coming your way. I mean, I had phenomenal highs, but I also had some really black spots. But I learned, the other thing I'd say to anybody is do it because you grow into who you really are. And it's fascinating. You'll be taken down some dark spaces, but then you'll be given the odd rainbow and you just say, yeah, got to do it. That's the thing, isn't it? It's it's, um, don't be afraid to try, you know, uh, and, and sometimes just don't over plan it just get just get on and do yeah, it yeah just get to it and yeah. you'll be okay and the other thing is it doesn't matter what age you are you don't need to be 20 or 30 I'm 50 and I'm setting up my new business you yeah. know I don't know how old you are but the point is you're never too old no. never no no I learn every day and I love learning and I love and and I've got to the point where I love making mistakes because it's the, it's the biggest learning thing you can have um, and if you're not making mistakes, you're not trying hard enough, really, to be honest. Um, yes, hard work. But Amelia, I thoroughly enjoyed it. And I'm still going to take a lay down. I'm going to go and get a <laughs> coffee now. <laughs> so am I, actually. Congratulations on, on, oh, on, thank you. on the podcast. I'm sure it'll be a great success. I'm happy thank to you. come on as soon as you want me. Brill, um, next year, January, yeah, I'm going to get time, you in. Any Brill, time, thank I'll you. Be there. But, but you. you know, all the best. And, um, uh, you know, thanks so much for today. Um, thank you so much luck. for having me. Thank you, Stuart. I'll, I'll You're wait, a honey. I can't wait to get me chocolate. Yeah, no, I've, I'm getting that in the post Monday. It'll be with you Tuesday. <laughs> thank you very much. Thanks, <laughs> thank you, Stu. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Just over five years ago, I did something that changed my life. What it did more than I could have ever realised. It helped me. I have met some absolutely amazing people, some of the people that work in some of these places. Many of them are volunteers, but some of them, it is their job. This is more than a job, this is a calling. 